Mr. Houston. We will now turn our attention to the opponents. And our first conferee is Mark Vesetti from the Kansas City Aid. Welcome, Mark. Wow, first, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is quite an honor. Uh, I stand here representing the Kansas National Education Association, uh, roughly 25,000 educators across the state, and we stand opposed strongly to this legislation. I'm not going to read what I wrote. You can read it at your leisure, but I'd like you to consider six minutes, because in six minutes, uh, a gunman in Parkland, Florida, murdered 17 people. So what's going to happen with a teacher with a weapon in those six minutes? I, I know Representative Parker is a teacher. I don't know who else on this committee is a teacher. I was a teacher for 13 years. And we did drills all the time. I know nowadays they do uh, active shooter drills. Uh, where I was a teacher, we did earthquake drills. And we did them regularly and continually. So imagine, if you will, in my fourth grade classroom, uh, well-drilled students, when the actual earthquake came, what my job was at that point. Because my students were panicked, screaming, crying, and not getting under their darn desks, which I had taught them to do, which meant I was out from under my desk trying to get kids under desks and safe with their hands behind their necks for falling flying glass and so on and so forth. I, I, you know, imagine what it is like in a classroom. You, you, you sit here and you think, well, I'll just get the kids to safety. And that's easy to do in an active shooter drill. It's easy to do in an earthquake drill. It's easy to do in a tornado drill. Try it when the bullets are sounding in the building. Try it when the building is shaking or the tornado is tearing up something across the street. I'm going to tell you it is not an easy thing to do. So I've got that to do first. I've got to get my kids safe. I've got to get my kids safe. The next thing I do is I have to get my handgun because I'm carrying it. Now, I suppose I could keep the handgun on my waist, but then, of course, it could be taken from me by a student who was angry. It could be uh, left somewhere accidentally when it was bothering me. It could, all kinds of things could happen. I think it's probably going to be kept safely. And in fact, th this legislature has heard from a company that sells actually kind of gun safes for teachers. OK, well, i got to go find my secured weapon and, and get it in my hand. So I've, I've gone to my gun safe. I've gone and, and opened it, got my gun, make sure it's loaded, get the safety off, um, and, and continue yelling at my kids, get back there. Don't come out because they're panicking. And then I'm going to go out in the hall with my handgun, and I'm going to face a guy with an AR-15, rapid firing, perhaps with a bump stock, and a very large capacity magazine on it. And I'm going to take that person down? No, I'm the one who's going to be dead. I'm going to be dead and away from my kids. Six minutes is what it, it, it took in, in Parkland, Florida to do that. You know, I, don't expect me as a teacher to save the day. I'm not a superhero. I listened to this uh, uh, talk about trained people and the Marine Corps and so on. My son was in the Marines too. He's an Iraq veteran. No one sent him with a handgun into combat with, with Iraqi insurgents. No one sent him in. You know what he was in? He was in an armored vehicle. He was a turret gunner in an armored vehicle. He had an automatic weapon. He stuck out of the top of an armored vehicle. That's what, his, that's what the, they gave him protect himself and protect his fellows. Not a handgun. And it's not going to mitigate the distance, folks. So, all right. I've done this to secure my kids. I'm now dead in the hall. And I'm going to get my name engraved in the Memorial to Fallen Educators in Emporia, Kansas. What an offense that we have to have a memorial to fallen educators that's going to have more names from Parkland, Florida engraved on it this June. And that's going to fill up the two full tablets they have. They're now going to have to go out and get more tablets for the next massacre. Think about shootings. They don't happen just in the school building. Think about Jonesboro, Arkansas, where kids tripped a fire alarm and then hid across in the forest and picked kids off as they came out of their school building. 
What's my handgun going to do? Think about Stockton, California, one of the first school shootings where it was on the playground. Somebody just shot through the fence on the playground, picking kids off during recess. Is this, is this going to save the day? I heard here today that massacres are going to happen. I would ask you, why are we okay that massacres are going to happen? And what is this bill to do about, what does it do to protect us in nightclubs, like in Orlando, in churches, like in Charleston, at country western concerts, like uh, Las Vegas, in movie theaters, like Aurora, Colorado, in parking lots like Phoenix, Arizona, at congressional softball practices like in Washington, D.C., and indeed on military bases that are not gun-free zones, they're loaded with guns, the guns are just secured as I would hope they would be in a school building, and you can't get to them that fast. You know, folks, if you want to do something, we can prevent massacres. There is stuff we can do to prevent massacres. We just have to be willing to do it. We just have to be willing to do it. We have to care more about our children than we do about anything else. And I think it's time that we looked at real things. Let's look at one other thing. I heard people say, well, the teacher would volunteer. That's not what Representative uh, Carpenter said. He said the school board will tell us whether or not. This, that's the school board's job. Well, what if I don't want to carry a gun? What if the school board says, we're going to carry guns, by the way, we're going to have fun on every grade level. I need somebody, Mark, in the fourth grade. How about it? Get yourself a permit. And I said, no. Of course, we have no job protection in, in Kansas anymore, so I'm going to get fired if I refuse to carry a gun. What am I going to do as a parent? I'm a parent of four children, forcing they're all out of school. But what if I said to my school board, my principal, do not put my child in a classroom with a gun? What's my principal supposed to do? If he does that, if he honors that, he's just out of the names of the teachers that don't have guns, which is illegal under this bill. This bill is just a bad idea. Let's turn our attention, let's look in the eyes of children. Let's turn our attention to protecting children, protecting American citizens from massacres, whether they're in our schools or in our nightclubs or anywhere else, congressional softball games. Let's start protecting the American people. And when you say massacres are going to happen, take a look at Scotland. Take a look at Australia. Scotland had a school massacre. They took an action. They haven't had one since. Australia, 20 years ago, had a school massacre. They took action. They haven't had one since. We can stop them if we have the will to do it. And arming teachers is not the way to do it. And I would stand for questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mark. Greg Aitha. PhD Assistant Superintendent of Shawnee Mission School District. Welcome to the committee, Rick. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Vickery and members of the House Insurance Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in opposition to House Bill 2789. Excuse me, Greg, just a second. We may have members that have to leave because we are in the caucus, so. Uh, I'm appearing on behalf of the uh, Shawnee Mission School District. Uh, House Bill 2789 has been clearly described by others, and we are aware of the provisions. We have no objections to the development of standards and planning. We are, however, opposed to the creation of a special endorsement uh, to a conceal and carry license that would allow staff to carry a concealed weapon in our schools. We are also opposed to Section 15E2 that threatens to punish school districts with enhanced financial burdens if they fail to arm their teachers. In the Shawnee Mission School District, the safety and security of our students is paramount to ensure a productive learning environment. Both teachers and students must feel safe. In the Shawnee Mission School District, we have designed and implemented a state-of-the-art security plan. We did this without the threat of a statute asserting negligence, without arming staff, 
and without statewide standards and plans. As our interim superintendent, Dr. Kenny Southwick has said, stated publicly more on more than one occasion, arming teachers is not the answer. One of our other school board members provided the best summary when saying, putting more guns in schools means creating more opportunities for students to access those guns. We have trained police officers in our schools who know how to deal with potentially dangerous situations. They are the only ones who should have access to lethal weapons, quote, unquote. The district security team consists of highly recognized security ex experts. Our board and our patrons believe we are providing all the protection available while keeping the focus on our purpose, teaching and educating children. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, my board president who is here today, uh, Mr. Brad Stratton. And our Board of Education last night at the board meeting had, had a conversation regarding this. Without taking official board action, it is clear our Board of Education is firmly against House Bill 2789. Our administration is firmly opposed to it. And I'll take a gamble that our teachers are opposed to it. So with that said, I, I stand ready. Questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mark Hallman, Kansas Association of School Boards. Welcome to Insurance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, this may be the first time in about 30 years I've ever been before the House Insurance Committee, so appreciate the opportunity to do that. Uh, obviously, we've heard a lot of testimony, so I'm going to be really brief. As you can see from my written comments, our primary reason for opposing this bill uh, is the section dealing with the uh, negligence for local boards. Our position is that we think the choice of whether or not to uh, have armed staff, which is currently permitted under Kansas as you heard, should remain with the local board, but we don't think the state should attempt to be involved in pushing that direction one way or another, and that is our primary problem with that section. I would simply note, to maybe get into the weeds a little bit, uh, sections 1 through 3 and 7 in this bill are very similar to revisions of House Bill 2773. We appreciate the way that bill was amended. So if you're considering this, we would encourage you to use the version that was approved by the Appropriations Committee in 2773, which I think is on general orders today that addresses several other concerns we have. Uh, we simply note that on new section five, which deals with the creation of the safer endorsement, um, we, we were hearing as neutral on that. Quite frankly, that's not something our membership have talked about. You just heard from one of our members that, that are concerned about that provision. That's simply something that our membership has not con considered. Uh, it's not something that, we, that has been brought to us by our members one way or the other. I guess the last thing we would comment on is the issue of new section six, which, with, which deals with the insurance company rates. I guess our primary concern there is uh, if, if, in fact, insurance companies are in the business of making a profit and trying to provide coverage, there must be some reason they are concerned about doing it, which is why they're not in this market, and why they won't generally provide coverage or it's very highly rated. So in, until we know how companies would actually respond, that also raises our concern about this bill. There are only, again, two or three insurance companies right now providing this kind of coverage. Uh, certainly, if one were to leave the, the, the state, leave that market, that would make it less competitive. And with that, I'll stand for questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mark. And I believe we have Chief Horn. Or David Smith. Yes. Oh, David Smith, Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools. Good morning. <coughs> I appreciate the chance to speak uh, to the committee. Uh, Chief Horn, our Chief of Police for the Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools Police Department, is here in the room. Um, we stand in opposition to this bill. Our Board of Education takes very seriously the responsibility for keeping our children safe. Um, one of the questions I get asked a lot by reporters 
how do we make decisions about inclement weather and snow days and, and, and deciding that. And what I tell them is we have to answer two questions. Can we get our kids to school safely? And can we make sure that they get home safely? And it's only when we can answer both of those questions, yes, that we have school. And that goes for all issues with regard to school safety. Our board has been very active in terms of making sure that we do all that we can. I'll give you some examples. Um, Chief Horn represents our police department. We have moved to sworn law enforcement officers to make sure that we have the personnel available to respond to any kind of an incident in one of our school buildings. We passed a bond issue in November of 2016. And as a part of that, we are doing safety and security upgrades to every single building in the district. So those will include secure entrances to make sure that we have physical barriers that would prevent someone from gaining easy access to the school. There will also be things like cameras and other kinds of security upgrades. So that's very important. We have also put in place the standard response protocol. 19 years ago in Columbine, Colorado, there was a school shooting, and the parents of one of the children who was lost in that shooting created the I Love You Guys Foundation, which provides resources and research with regard to school safety. They have implemented the standard response protocol, which is, and that word standard is incredibly important, because we have four different responses to any kind of emergency. If there's a situation where there is a danger and that danger is outside of the school building, then we go on a lock out. And we bring everybody inside, we lock all of our exterior doors, and then we continue with our day until we are cleared by law enforcement. If that danger, we're not, we don't know where it is, or if that danger has penetrated the exterior envelope of the building, we go on lock down. And then we say over the loudspeakers, lights locked out of sight. Every individual in that building, every individual, other than our law enforcement officers, every individual gets behind a locked door. And we have installed locks on every door so that we can lock the door from the inside they turn out the lights and they get out of sight of the window to that door. Lights, locks, and out of sight. And then they do not open the door. They do not open the door. That door is opened by somebody with a key. So, and everybody knows that. We practice it regularly. You know, we, we all of us, we, we are what we regularly do. And we regularly practice that so that everybody knows it. We also have informed our uh, first responders in Kansas City, Kansas, so that they understand that, so that when our police officers, when the Kansas City, Kansas police enter a building in an emergency situation, they know everybody will be behind a locked door, and they can handle that situation without having to worry that somebody like a teacher with a weapon is going to be trying out and trying to, to handle the situation. It's very clear, and we practice it, and unfortunately, the thing we worry most about is somebody not following that standard response protocol, because that individual would be putting themselves, they would be putting individuals around them, and they would be putting law enforcement personnel in danger. So we have, we have uh, some very strict protocols that we follow, and we feel like those make sure that our children and our staff are safe. I would stand for questions about what we do at the public Thank you, Nick. Nikki McDonald, the Lake of Public Education Network. Welcome, Ms. Nikki. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I come before you in several roles. Um, I'm a former teacher. I've only taught in Title I schools, both in Arkansas and in Olathe. Um, I was a first grade teacher, and I was an English as a second language teacher. Um, so I have a, a unique experience there. I'm a current stay-at-home mom, and I've found myself over the last couple years falling into a community organizer role. Um, it's become more and more apparent in Kansas that our public schools have been under attack. And it's not from the majority of the people who work in this building. It's really a very small faction of people. Um, this bill quite frankly got me off of my couch and spurred me to action. I feel like this weekend um, I had the, a fortunate experience to go to the March for Our Lives in um, downtown Kansas City, Missouri. And what I heard there were students who said, please listen to us. I heard teachers that said, please listen to us. And quite frankly, I don't see a lot of evidence of that in this room. 
Um, so I come before you as the leader of a new nonpartisan advocacy group that is issue-based. It's called Elect the Public Education Network, or OPEN. And due to the rushed nature of this committee hearing, um, most of the teachers that I contacted and parents were unable to get off of work with such short notice. So many submitted testimony and emails, and I appreciate that process. Um, but I come to tell you that I've, I've put some polls on our Facebook group. I've asked friends, neighborhood, neighbors, parents, teachers. Not one person in my school district has been in favor of this bill. And I would argue against people saying that's an alarmist sort of thing that Brett Parker put out about how it's militarizing our schools. As a former teacher, I would not be comfortable working in an environment where people are caring and I don't have a chance to know that. As a parent, I would not be comfortable with my child being in a school and me not being able to know which, which teacher or staff member is armed. Um, I would argue, I forgot which, which representative over here mentioned, the rate of mistakes would be higher because more guns would be there. The American, American Academy of Pediatrics um, stands by their stance that says that the safest homes are, are gun free. And I think that would go to reason to argue about um, schools. Having more guns would not make them more safe. If you're gonna do something, I urge you to address the mental health crisis in our communities. Our students are having crises. They are not, um, there are not resources available um, to the degree that there should be. In my own family, we've sought out mental health, um, help for my elementary age sons, and with insurance, with time, with some background in early childhood development, I'm still having a hard time navigating that process. What we could use from you all is some assistance there. In Olathe, we're really proud that our district has been very proactive, but they're using money for resources for mental health that really you've allocated to help them teach. Um, so please don't ask more of our teachers. Please don't ask them to um, take on yet another role. And with all due respect to Mr. Clay, the Marine who spoke earlier and teaches high school, my father's a Vietnam veteran, and I know very well um, that he has that, he's also a fireman, so he has the similar mentality where he would go out and put his life on the line for his students or his, his the people that work with him. But I'll tell you, every teacher I've worked with and know would do that with or without a handgun. We're not asking more of them um, just by being there with, I mean, they would, they would automatically already be putting their lives on the line. Um, in Olathe, we have the Alice Protocol. Um, the districts tried pretty well to inform the public about what would happen. There are drills going on. There's some room for improvement there, but I think that many districts are already doing the things that need to be done with securing um, entrances and doors, having protocol. Um, but with, with due respect to Mr. Clay, I, I noted one quote he said. He said, my son has a temper like his daddy. Now, if I were working with him, I would have serious pause. If I were um, a member of his school board, I would have serious pause. When I go to the grocery store, I have serious pause because it's legal in the state for people to carry, to show me their guns, or to not show me their guns. My children have pointed them out to me before, and it makes them uncomfortable. So with, with all due respect, I appreciate that this body is trying to find an answer. Um, there is no magical fix here. I would encourage us to have more civil dialogue um, but I want you to understand that the conversation in a rural setting, an urban setting, even a suburban setting, is a very different conversation. Um, and as far as this committee being an insurance committee, I think it's really laughable that you would try to force an insurance company to cover something like this, when at the same time you want to encourage business. You can't be pro-business and then be punitive in this fashion. So um, just, just to review, as a mom, as a daughter of a veteran, as a community member, as a former teacher, and as a community organizer speaking on behalf of the parents and students and staff, 30,000 students, second base district in the state, I would hope that we could do better than this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And we're going to have to uh, ask our opponents to kind of move a little quicker. We have about basically about 30 minutes and any time for questions too. So, um, Lisa Patterson Kinsley, or Kinsey, uh, Mainstream Coalition. Thank you, yes, 
Spanish League of Washington Hennessy with Mason Coalition. We have Welcome just asked to the committee. Sorry. Welcome to the committee. Oh, thank you. Um, Mainstream opposes the passage of HB 2789. Arming teachers is the wrong approach to any gun violence in public schools. Students, parents, teachers, and administrators and school boards do not want to arm teachers with concealed weapons in the classroom. Students have made their opinions crystal clear across the nation and throughout Kansas this past weekend. <laughs> school boards and school districts should not be held liable, as this bill would hold them, for their dedication to teaching, not policing. A sweeping requirement in this bill rejects the rights of voters to make their own choices in, in their own communities. And finally, we have seen no research that shows that more guns, in this case, more guns than arming teachers, would reduce gun violence. Instead, we urge the legislature to enact common sense firearm restrictions and increase funding for counselors and school social workers in public schools. Help our children. Don't imprison them in their own school buildings. Thank you. Michael Kaplan, FBI Special Agent. Michael over here. Joella Boyd, Mom's Demand Action. Chairman Vickery, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Joella Hoy. I volunteer as the chapter leader for the Kansas chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. As a parent, as a gun owner, as a gun safety advocate, I urge you to oppose HB 2789. My written testimony gives you facts about why arming teachers is not the solution to school safety. But I'm here today to tell you about my experience on being on lockdown for 10 minutes with four, over 40 kindergartners. I volunteer in my son's classroom on Wednesday afternoons and on February 7th, 2018, I was getting ready for a group math activity when I heard over the intercom, code red. My initial reaction was, what are the odds that I would be here for a lockdown drill? But I could tell by the looks on the teachers' faces that this was not an anticipated drill. So I quickly grabbed my phone and put it in my back pocket as the teachers locked the doors and we ushered single file all the kindergartners into the storage closet. I made sure to be the last one to enter so that I could put my place myself against the solid door that we could not see out of. We were getting crackles over the radio. We did not know what was happening. And as each minute passed, the more afraid I got. But the teachers did everything right. The kids were quiet and calm because we were making little motions together. They knew to be quiet, and I had to do it not only as an example to them, but because I was panicked and afraid, and it, and it worked to calm me down. I made eyes at my son's teacher and said, is this a practice? And she shrugged her shoulders. I grabbed a solid wooden block that was on top of it, and I barricaded myself against the door and told myself, I will not open this door unless I hear it all clear. I took a deep breath and thought, at least I'm here with my man. At least this was my day in the classroom. He was in the back of the room. I was against the door. So I couldn't have gotten to him, but I kept getting glances of his face in case it was the last time that I would see it. I listened for gunfire. It never came because it ended up being a prank. A student had gotten a hold of a teacher's radio and called it in. There was no actual threat, but my fear was real. Seeing those little faces in that room was real, and this is far too common in our country. Instead of, we should be here talking about sensible legislation that would keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people, not about arming American teachers in our schools here in Kansas. Please vote no on HB 27, or no, I lost the number, 2789. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. Rabbi Reber, and to send the action. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Rabbi. Uh, members of the committee, I'm Rabbi Moji Reber. I'm the director of Kansas Interfaith Action. Uh, we're a statewide multi-faith issue advocacy organization that works on a variety of racial, economic, and environmental justice issues. And we're standing up, obviously, in opposition to HB 2789. 
Uh, we mostly represent uh, mainline Protestants, Jewish, Muslim, Unitarian Universalist, and some uh, Catholic uh, uh, people, clergy, and uh, congregations. And all of those denominations are uniform in their opposition to the loosening of gun laws that's happened in this country over the last 10 years. They all uh, call for a statement, they all have statements saying, uh, decrying the uh, rising incidents of gun violence in society and urging legislative action to address it. Um, and I can, uh, some of those are in my state, in my written testimony, and I can also point you to more. Um, I believe that uh, this issue, this bill, addresses a symptom uh, and not the larger problem of gun violence in our society. Um, we have ways to address massacres. Um, they, would, they would include universal background checks, limitations on assault-style weaponry and, and uh, large capacity magazines, and also red flag laws and such. Um, these are not in question here today. Um, the, 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 the attitude of this legislature has been more, the answer to gun violence is more guns, and that's a mistake, uh, and it causes the problem that it pro probably uh, that it intends to solve. Um, in, since, since 2010, or 26 I guess it is, the legislature has forced guns into more and more public places, forced guns into libraries and municipal buildings against the opposition of the municipalities, forced guns into college campuses against the opposition of the, of the colleges, and now is trying to force guns using the emotional issue of school shootings to force guns into K-12 schools. Uh, it's, 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 if, the, if the definition of, of do, uh, the definition of insanity is doing something over and over and expecting a different result, this is insane. This is doing it again and expecting a different result. Um, facts, not politics. People are saying facts, not politics. More guns equals more accidents. It equals more suicides. It equals more domestic violence, which teachers, unfortunately, are not immune to. More guns equals more violence, and that is fact and not politics. I urge you to stop the insanity. I urge you to vote this bill down, and let's start talking about common sense legislation that will work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Ruth Ann French Hodson. strong opposition to the bill. Let me begin by introducing myself. I'm an attorney at a large Kansas City law firm, and I counsel clients, mainly large companies around the nation and world, on statutory requirements and represent them in litigation. I am also the mother of a third grader at Frank Russian Elementary in the Kansas City, Kansas School District. And I am a proud product of the Kansas Public Education and a much smaller rural Haven School District in South Central Kansas. As an attorney, as someone who reads statutes daily as part of her job and see how they are interpreted by courts, I'm here to lay out why this bill, and yes, the Senator, I read every word of this bill, why this bill is very bad public policy. First, and most importantly, while this bill may be styled as a means of choice for school districts, anyone who actually reads the bill will realize that school districts have very little choice in any of the mandates. As someone who grew up and worked in small world schools, and who now has a son attending one of our most urban and diverse school districts, I understand the school districts around our state have different demands and different community resources. But if you decide that school districts should have this choice, it really should be a community by community choice. But let's make one thing clear. As it stands now, this bill is a mandate for a one-size-fits-all approach with no local checks on who carries guns within local schools. First, the draconian negligence provision. I appreciate the offer, and I don't know if Representative Carpenter is still here, to amend the bill to take that out. And I would urge you to follow through with that promise, because that provision would mean districts, especially those with little resources, have little choice but to authorize employees to carry concealed firearms. This is no choice. This is coercion. And from perusing the rest of the bill, 
There are very good reasons why a school district may choose to not allow employees to carry concealed handguns. Most notably, school districts would have no ability to choose who is armed in a school district. The Act provides, and I quote, any employee who has obtained a safer school's endorsement on such employee's license to carry a concealed handgun shall be authorized by the Board of Education of the district employing such a member to carry a concealed handgun in any building of such district. This is in stark contrast to Texas, which we've heard much about, where the schools are the ones that select one marshal for every 400 students. And reporting on that program indicates that school districts give much thought about who would be responsible with a gun at all times, be diligent in their training, and respond appropriately for the end of crisis. But here, Kansas school districts have no say on how many of their employees can carry concealed handguns or in what buildings. Nor do they have any ability to screen and approve of employees. Once a school district votes to allow concealed handguns in schools, <coughs> it has absolutely no control over which of its employees can bring those guns into schools. Local districts should absolutely have the final say on who's coming into their buildings with weapons. While Ms. Smith, the history teacher, may meet all the requirements, the principal or the board may know from past experience that she's impulsive or prone to forgetting important things around the building. As in Texas, at the very least, school districts should be the ones deciding who has guns on its premises. One of the values that we hold here in Kansas is that overarching mandates that may work in one area may not be the best for others. But in this bill, we put no trust into local knowledge of either what programs will work for a district or who will best protect the district. Local control of schools is one of the bedrocks of our democracy, and this bill seeks to strip that away and force local schools to adopt policies that may be completely unsuitable for their districts. But even worse, the bill also does little to ensure that those carrying handguns in our schools the schools that nurture my son, and likely your children, and your grandchildren as well, are well-trained or competent or stable. The U.S. Supreme Court in Kansas law requires that police officers be adequately trained through hundreds of hours of basic training and annual continuing education before they take on the role of defending us from those who would harm us. But as this bill stands now, it only requires that teachers go through one eight-hour conceal and carry training session every four years. That training session doesn't even require that an applicant show they can shoot a gun. While the bill states that the Attorney General and the Kansas Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training should establish requirements for specific school employee training, the bill contains no mandates on what those requirements should be. Should teachers, should the mandates include firearms competency exams? or active shooter training? Should licensees be required to attend drain, range time? Should the training be done every year? Should there be renewal training requirements? Right now, there are none beyond the concealed carry course. Indeed, such vague delegation language to an agency likely violates administrative and constitutional law. It should be you, <laughs> legislators who are accountable to the voting public that set the parameters for training because unless you do, there is no guarantee that you will, um, what the training will look like, and that we will actually have well-trained teachers and that their training will be kept up over time. The bill also has no requirement that applicants go through background checks as part of the renewal process or any mental health examination to carry a concealed handgun in our children's schools. For all the talk of mental health being a priority, I think that you would all would want to ensure that the individuals allowed to daily carry a gun around the future of our state meet those most stringent requirements. If school employees are going to take on the role of first responders, they should be required to have the same training and background qualifications as our law enforcement to appropriately handle rare but highly stressful and chaotic circumstances without making the situation worse. This bill should be contrasted to the Texas Marshall Program, which we have heard that much about today from the other side. But this bill bears little resemblance to the Texas law. That law has much more stringent requirements. It requires 80 hours of training every two years, including active shooter training, firearms proficiency testing, and mental health evaluations. It also has more stringent renewal requirements. 
and then in the schools, Texas law requires the firearms to be kept in lockboxes at all times, except during active shooter situations. And the firearm can only use specific types of ammunition to reduce the risk of injuries. Finally, unlike the Kansas bill, the Texas law requires employees receive permission from the school district. Lastly, this bill does not appear to have any provision for how an individual can lose their safer certification. Given that the bill provides no means for schools or districts to approve or disapprove of qualified employees carrying a concealed handgun in district buildings, one would think that the bill would at least have provisions for revoking a license. So if Ms. Smith did keep leaving her concealed gun in the bathroom, or inappropriately threaten the child with it, or use it recklessly in a classroom, the school district would have no means to keep Ms. Smith from continuing to bring her concealed handgun to school. <coughs> This bill deserves a no vote for every one of you, regardless of how you feel about guns or gun control. It destroys local control of schools, and it does not adequately protect our students or school employees. I appreciate the time you've given me today, and I realize I went long, and I urge you to vote against HB 2789. And I've only gone through the broad strokes, and I, I appreciate and stand for questions. <coughs> Thank you, Ruth. Jennifer Bowles. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Jennifer Bowles. I'm a Shawnee Mission School District mom and an attorney in Lanza. Um, I'm here today with Education First Shawnee Mission. Uh, we're a local pro public education pack for the Shawnee Mission in the Shawnee Mission School District area. Um, Shawnee Mission School District parents, students, teachers, and school board overwhelmingly do not believe that arming teachers is the answer. Um, we should honor our teachers' chosen profession of educator. Teachers will leave the state as a result of this bill, and our teachers are the reason that we have some of the best public schools in the nation. Um, we've received many messages from parents and teachers who are very concerned by the language of this bill uh, and the punishment that the negligence requirement um, imposes. And I urge you to oppose this as a mom and as an education advocate to protect our public schools. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Megan Peters. <coughs> Apologize, one of our members has to carry the bill. Hello, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Megan Peters, and as a parent to two elementary school children in the Shawnee Mission School District, I'm here to voice my opposition to this bill. As chair of Education for Shawnee Mission, which Jennifer just spoke about, I get the opportunity to speak with our teachers in our district every day, and they are overwhelmingly against being armed in our schools. In fact, less than a week ago, the Shawnee Mission School District held a forum on guns for teachers parents, students, and community members. And at this town hall, Shawnee Mission East social studies teacher David Muhammad stated, you can either turn me into a police officer or let me be a teacher. If you make me patrol around with a gun, that will be my focus and I will no longer be an efficient educator. The Shawnee Mission School District is here today as well and has already stated that they are publicly against this bill. But this bill states that districts who do not allow their teachers to carry a gun at school will be considered negligible, which means if there was an attack at a Shawnee Mission School, the Shawnee Mission School District would be responsible, regardless of alternate security measures, such as an on-site armed resource officer. This absolutely punishes school districts who refuse to arm their teachers. I feel that this bill is a horrible idea, and as a constituent, public education advocate, and most importantly, as a mother to two amazing Kansas school children, I am voicing my opposition, and I urge you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Nicole Brown. Nick. Beecher. Beecher. Is Nick here? Sorry, Nick, if I got your last name wrong. No, that's fine. It's Deal. Deal. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come. I'm a parent of a Blue Valley student. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of stuff like everyone else on bike in the Blue Valley School This is my first time getting up and doing something like this. Um, I just want to make a few points um, about uh, 
gun safety. Um, research shows that guns in the presence of children will raise the risk, it triples the risk of suicide, and doubles the risk of homicide. That's just not acceptable in our schools. Um, throughout this, um, it kept seeming like it was a way to uh, make it so that we wanted to get the kids out of public school. It seemed like it was trying to force the parents to either say, I'm going to homeschool, I'm going to get teachers to leave Kansas. Uh, that's just not acceptable. Um, the only other really thing that stuck out at me was the part about um, the list of the teachers carrying being uh, confidential. Um, it listed class C misdemeanor as the punishment for that or what you'd be charged with. Um, and all, all I can say is that as a, as a parent, if that's where it took, I would strap my civil disobedience boots on and I would go stand in front of the board every day with the picket sign. Um, ready to get charged with my misdemeanor to find out which of my which of my uh, kids' teachers are caring. Uh, I think that part was just absurd. Um, a lot of stuff's already been gone over, so I'll just uh, ask one more thing. Um, who will be deemed negligent uh, when a teacher follows the lead of one of our elected representatives and leaves their weapon uh, unattended? Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, Emily Bodeker. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, let's go to pop mic. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to go fast. My name is Emily Bodeker. I am a former teacher. I am a current school secretary at Pinkney Elementary School in Lawrence, Kansas. I'm also the parent of a first grader who's in school in Lawrence. Um, we've heard a lot today about how teachers don't want to be armed. I think that it's safe to say that most of the teachers in my building do not want to be armed. I think it's safe to say that most of them will leave their professions, that they've spent countless hours and thousands of dollars to become teachers. I think it's safe to say that my family might leave the state of Kansas. We, I do not want my daughter to go to a school where her teacher will be armed or there is the chance that they can be armed. And I understand that concealed carry is already a law here in Kansas. That doesn't mean I agree with it. Um, you know, us in education are really used to people in politics kind of telling us what to do. When I look around this room, I see very few people that have probably uh, hit with a group of 40 kindergartners during a drill. I see very few people that have probably been the people that walk around to ensure that the kids are quiet. Um, and I see very few people that would be sitting at the front desk to push the button to let people in. Uh, I've done all three of those things. So um, I get a little worked up maybe because I think you guys should be talking to teachers about this. You guys should be talking to educators. I think it was very sneaky how this bill was just kind of slid in. I think that there's no surprise to me that there are very few teachers behind me because where are they at 8 o'clock on a Tuesday morning? They're teaching. They're doing their jobs. So um, I'm going to implore you to do your jobs. I'm going to implore you to listen to our students. I'm going to implore you to listen to our educators. Um, just one more quick note. We talk about there's going to be training. You know. Teachers at my building can't buy paper. We can't buy books for our kids. We are worried about the budgets every year, something that I think some of you might have a hand in. So when I'm wondering about who's paying for this extra training, if we're going to train teachers to events, will we also send them to trainings to implore them to be better teachers? So that's where I'm at. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Emily. Um, Anya Boyd. Well, I want to tell you the reality of gun violence. Um, my daughter was killed October 13th of 2009. She left two children, very young, five months and two and a half. Um, over the time, the two and a half year old um, had a lot of issues. Um, one of her issues was to follow me around my house in every room. And one day I asked her, why was she doing that? And she said, because I don't want you to leave me and never come back like my mom did. And I assured her that um, I wasn't going to leave her. I was going to be here, you know, half dirt. Um, 
it's been really hard uh, raising her with the issues that she has. Um, we cannot go out in a public place where there are people who uh, are carrying guns. Um, I remember one time at Cece's Pizza, I'm waiting for my pizza, but they never have the kind I like. She sees a person with a gun. She says, we have to leave, T-Ma, we have to leave. And I'm like, I'm gonna eat my pizza bird. <laughs> no, there's a guy, he has a gun, he's gonna shoot us. I said, no, he's not gonna shoot us, Coriana. I promised your mom if anything ever happened to her, I would protect you, and I am not gonna let him shoot you or me. And so I went and talked to the manager, and I said, hey, can you um, do something about that? Well, no, we really can't. I said, yes, you can, because it's not a law yet. She said, well, he's probably law enforcement. I'm thinking, no, nah, he's not law enforcement. Um, and also, another time of hers, kindergarten year. The, you know, school is supposed to be a great thing for kids. And I know this because I used to be a child care teacher. Um, she came home and she says, I don't want to ever go back to that school again. I said, why? You have a nice teacher. She says, but somebody's going to come into my school and shoot me. And I'm like, who told you that? Don't, don't listen to me things we don't really know about. No, we have this thing and they told us we're supposed to throw books and pencils at a person with a gun. I said, what? No, that's gonna get you killed even faster. Hey, you fall on the ground and that clip your dad. You don't throw stuff at a person with a gun, it's gonna tick them off. <laughs> These are some of the issues that my granddaughter has had ever since she has been two and a half. She is 11 years old right now. She's been in counseling ever since three. Uh, once I found out, um, the police interrogated her father in front of her. So she knows how many bullets entered her mother's body. She knows every body part where her mother was shot at. Uh, no child should have to know that or witness gun violence to be the matter. And I think um, being a concerned grandparent slash mother, um, I would take my grandchildren out of public school if that was to happen, teachers carrying guns. My granddaughter would freak out over that every day when I try to put her on the bus. I already know it, and I would not want to subject her to that any more than what she's already been through. So uh, I urge you guys who probably have never seen the reality of gun violence to uh, open your eyes and really look and that's not gonna keep our kids safe. Thank you, Latan. And committee, uh, we have a pack and a written testimony in opposition to Michelle, uh, Michelle uh, Nikki, our uh, Okay. Assistant stayed here until ten o'clock last night. I for all of this. Uh, got here at seven and earlier this morning, six forty-five. So, uh, questions, committee? Representative Corbin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Coleman. Mr. Coleman. One of the questions I have for you. Do you have any comment or would you be open to maybe thinking about doing some type of fire education in public schools or any <laughs> under safety? So, so the knowledge is not a dangerous thing, so everybody kind of has an idea of what maybe is out there. Uh, was, was, the school, was the school system open to something like that? We are supportive of the provision in 2773 that does allow the state board to develop guidelines um, that could be based on the Eddie program or others uh, and allow schools to do those. Our only belief is we don't think schools should have to follow any particular set of guidelines and that also ought to be a local choice. When you say that, what I was trying to get at is everybody would have kind of the same, whatever you agree upon, Oh, everybody would be on the same page. It wouldn't be one way anymore. It's one way to be. Is that what you're saying? 
Actually, our position is usually be we don't object to there being kind of state guidelines for boards to look at. We just think you should not be overly restrictive on how schools teach anything, whether it's firearms or math or anything else, giving people options to see what works best. Thank you. After listening to your testimony, if this bill was changed more like the Texas model, would you be more be more inclined to uh, support it? I would hope that it would be more modeled in that way. I think you've heard from a ton of teachers and administrators, and I hope you would listen to them. But I do think if you're going to pass anything, it should have the kind of requirements and provisions that something more like the Texas model did. Um, that would go a long way for me. Thank you. Representative Epley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is for Mr. Tizetti. If he doesn't want to come back, please. Yes, sir. Mark, thanks for being here. and. Uh, Appreciate your testimony on the, connecting the dots on coercing teachers to, to carry. I, I hadn't thought of that before, so I found that interesting. Um, if we remove the section on presumption of negligence that, that everyone's talked a lot about, do you think that would have any, um, does that make it less of a concern for you about the coercion piece, or do you think that's, I, I'm trying to figure out how to connect that together, and you may want to comment on that. I think the negligence piece is, is completely different. If, as Representative Carpenter said, the school board will simply make a decision that people are going to be armed or not, the negligence provision in here, as appalling as it is, has no impact on that. If the school board says, I, I live in Lawrence, let's say I was teaching in Lawrence. If the Lawrence school board said, we, we are going to have armed teachers, that's part of our security plan, and we're going to have one on every grade level and they go to a grade level and, and say, which one of you is going to do this, get the permit and do it? And all of us, fourth grade teachers, said, no, not me. And the school board said, no, one of you is going to do it. You will do it. The negligence provision uh, in this bill, as I see it, is a way to force school districts, force school boards to arm their teachers, to, to agree to arm their teachers. It takes away from the school boards the choice uh, by making them essentially guilty until proven innocent of uh, uh, negligence should something occur. Jonesboro would, would be a great example. That something happens off school grounds, shooting onto a playground, kills a couple kids, they don't have armed teachers in this school district, and under that, under the bill, the negligence provision, uh, if a parent were to sue the school district, the school district would be deemed negligent. Now they can rebut that, but, but it, it is, guilty until proven innocent in that case. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the negligence piece is taken out. Does that diminish the coerciveness that a district might go through as it regards its teachers? I don't think so at all, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My question is for Dr. Atha. And as you're walking up here, I'll start. Um, we heard a lot today about what some people believe are the solutions and some people think that this bill is not the solution. We also heard about mental health, and I, I know this goes in a slightly different direction, but I believe we've lost more Kansas students to suicide in the last year than we have to school shootings in the last 100, um, which is heartbreaking. Do you believe something that both would probably help prevent school shootings, but also would help with that would be more funding for counselors in schools and mental health for our students at our public schools. Thank you for the question, Representative Cox. I, I certainly think uh, the mental health issues, uh, the growing mental health issues facing the state of Kansas and all school districts is uh, it's increasing dramatically. Uh, with the decline in funding throughout the state over the last several years, the state has had to make several cuts in all 208, 286 school districts. And some of those cuts has fallen in the area of counseling and social workers and 
so on and so forth in those support areas that can then help in addressing the mental health issues in our state. Uh, I certainly think uh, some of the funding, if we get increased funding, if we just earmark for guidance counselors and for social workers, uh, and that will take a significant amount of money for us to put a counselor in all of our elementary schools would be approximately $2.3 million. We're short 10 social workers of having social workers in all of our elementary buildings right now, and that would cost us $680,000 to have social workers and counselors in every building in Shawnee Mission. So, heaven forbid we've had more than our share of suicides in our school district, as you know. As a matter of fact, we had one last week. So I hope that addresses your question. Representative <coughs> Mr. Chairman, my question is for Dr. Hathauer, David Smith, either the school districts. Uh, you both spoke about some of your safety procedures. What do you think would happen if there were a shooting and and law enforcement came, but they were teachers, adults with guns uh, in the building when law enforcement arrives. Sure, as I mentioned in my previous testimony, the standard response protocol says that all individuals in the building, other than sworn law enforcement, will be behind a closed, locked door. So when first responders come, they would expect to see nobody. And if they do, I think that would create potential for a significant and tragic accident. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a question for um, Rabbi Weaver. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate your passion. And I just wanted to ask you a question. You had mentioned the definition of ins uh, insanity, talking about more guns and more violence. But uh, I would like to ask you a question. Do you, do you know what's in common uh, from 1950? through today with regard to mass shootings, uh, over 98% have one thing in common. So that's over in more than a 67 year period. Would you like to know what they have in common? I think I know what your answer is because I've heard this talking point before. They said it before. Okay. Um, but I think that, that Representative Parker has the statistics. That's, that's, it's a talking point. It's a false talking point. I can, uh, I'll speak with you later, but it's not, at 98% in the gun-free zones, it's an NRA talking point, it's false. It, it's actually not a false talking point. It comes from Crime Prevention Research Center. Be happy to talk with you about that offline. But I, I would just make a comment at this point, thank you, Rabbi, that I think it's, it's ignorant and possibly more than ignorant to ignore the fact that when uh, in country zones, it creates an issue, and that's the reason they have a, a term for that, of being a soft target. So, in, in the, the number of instances that have been alluded to where there are guns allowed in schools, um, there have been no issues pointed to that becoming a problem. And possibly there should be more stringent requirements, as alluded to in Texas, but I think, and I've also heard the statement that um, coercion or force teachers into this, but the, the bill is completely voluntary with regard to whether a teacher could uh, conceal or carry. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Quinn, more questions? Representative Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, question uh, Mark Bissetti, please. First of all, let me say one thing. Teachers are not sheep. I think that the Heartland teachers are heroes who stayed with their students, calmed them, hid them, and made the difficult decision at some point of whether to leave their, their sheltered place. Do you believe that uh, teachers really need to stay with their students when there is um, a lockdown situation or any sort of threat? I absolutely believe that. that. As a teacher, my first allegiance is to the 
20 or 25 kids that I'm charged with every day or if I'm a high school teacher at that hour. My commitment is to them. My commitment is to stay with them, keep them calm, keep them safe, whether that's in an earthquake or a tornado or an active shooter situation. My kids don't need me to walk away from them at that time. They need me to be their rock. Thank you, sir. Let me ask you another question. I had a coffee recently in my district, and we did discuss this sort of thing quite a bit, and there was a teacher present. And her suggestion was that we have low enough class sizes so that teachers can really get to know their students and be aware when a situation is arising or a student is beginning to demonstrate a red flag, shall we say, or the beginnings of one. Do you believe that we need more training for teachers to be able to do that? I think we all agree that the goal of low class sizes is one we aspire to, and it's difficult. Perhaps more training and recognizing issues with students and more counselors to be able to back them up with information. I would say, first of all, that my organization has supported every bill to have training for teachers to spot problems with kids, whether that's the Jason Flat Act dealing with suicide or Aaron's Law dealing with sexual abuse. We have supported every single one of those bills that require teacher training for our for the people we represent. We absolutely believe in professional development and teacher training for a wide variety of things, including recognizing those signs. We also believe that it is critically important that we staff our schools with sufficient numbers of counselors and social workers to deal with issues as they arise with children. Uh, every, every Children need a lot of support. There's a lot of stress in this world, especially with social media stuff and cyber things going on. Our kids need more support, not less support. So we would support efforts to increase dramatically the number of counselors in schools, to increase the number of social workers in schools, and to provide teachers with the training necessary to recognize the signs and, and be able to get a child the help they need. Thank you, Mark. We have one more Thank question. You, I would Hodge, I'd like uh, Mark the City of Montana to come to the microphone. Um, I would like to know uh, what, what are your intentions as far as uh, negotiating salary for someone who chooses to get the supplemental. I mean, they're going to be a security guard plus a teacher. Is this something like a forty thousand dollar a year job in addition to their regular duties? Or what are we looking at as far as additional revenue, revenue for a teacher? Well, I'll try to answer that by saying I, I may disagree a little bit with Mr. Desetti on the issue of other teachers to be compelled to do this. He raises a point. I guess the question is if. Being armed is not part of kind of your regular duty assignments, then I guess arguably this would fall under the category of being a supplemental contract. But certainly I think if that was the case, then we would be expected to, to pay teachers to do that. Uh, I don't think that this bill speaks to that uh, at all. Um, so I, I don't think this would probably be somewhat charting new ground if this did happen. Agree. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Great I do agree. But, but let me make that point very, very clear. We don't want to be paid to carry guns. We want to be paid to teach. Yes. That's what we really want. <laughs> the bottom line is Kansas teachers are among the worst paid teachers in the United States right now. Let's pay teachers to teach and let our school resource officers, school district police officers handle security. Let's back a bill like 2773 that does address security issues, security plans, and safety plans. But let's let teachers teach and let's pay them to do it. I agree with you. It's uh, Unfortunately, I'm not sure if the whole body of the house would. Uh, so we need to be prepared for this thing to actually see live. I guess my point is, um, I also want to ask, uh, uh, would you, one more question, would you, 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 would
Twenty-seven eighty-nine. Sorry, you're out of time. It's ten o'clock.